Uh, okay, so uh, hello everyone. We'll talk about the GoGoConf we attended lately. So GoGoConf was a conference about Golang, obviously. Um, it happened in Krakow, so we may go on. So it happened in Museum Galicia. Uh, this was a very nice building, very nice place. Uh, you can see Gregos being professional and making a, taking a picture there. So it's a proof that I was there. Yes. So exactly. yeah. Uh, basically, the service was really cool. Uh, there was some nice, uh, how do you say this, um, wallpapers, let's say, uh, with uh, Go code, which is professional as well. So one of the first talks was when we should go go by Hubert Drukowski, who was uh, who is a backend engineer at Brainly, and um, yeah, basically it was uh, a talk which was about his experiences with Go and what he thinks uh, is a good opportunity to use Go in his project. So let's go on. So one of the first things he asked was um, how many of you are actually not using Golang in production yet? And uh, this was the moment we were paralyzed, kind of, because we are not using Golang in production yet, even though we really want to. And uh, the result of this question was that half of the audience, even more than a half, has raised their hands. So we were, we were relieved because of that, because obviously it seemed that lots of people who were there with us had the same experience as we have. So they are learning Go and they want to provide Go in the production, but they're not able to do that yet. Yeah, Seriously. until it happened, I mean, I think the question was asked. We were feeling a bit stressed, but uh, because yeah. we are feeling that we are the only ones who are not using Go in production, but then we realize that we are not the only ones. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Fine. And uh, so the Hubbard started talking about how Go is perceived these days uh, as, as the present state of it. And um, he states that, in his opinion, Golang has surpassed the peak of inflated expectations and uh, the, the hype. And at the moment, Golang is in the state where people realize that Golang is good for part of some things and it's not really as good for other things. And uh, it's a straight way to the uh, slope of enlightenment and plateau of productivity where you get a lot of nice libraries and a lot of nice ideas how to use Golang and good case studies that help you to create good software. So you can see also the Google uh, results of uh, interest in, uh, in this uh, search query. So it seems to kind of agree with Hubert's statement. And uh, yeah, we have to see how it goes in the future. So obviously, Hubert also had to bring things like performance uh, into his uh, statements and uh, ideas. So obviously, Golang is something that I really like. And uh, I think that it's a great language that can actually replace C++ and allow developers like us who focus on Ruby and some kind of higher level languages to create a software that is performant, that is memory effective. And um, Hubert has provided us some uh, comparisons between Node.js and Go. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can see the difference here. Uh, Golang has like five times less memory foot footprint than Node.js, which is cool. Yeah. Um, also, Obviously, one of the things that is the foundation uh, of Go is that it's idiomatic. Uh, it's, it's really simple to write, co write Golang code. And uh, even though if you haven't seen Golang code before, you should be able to read the code if you know any other language. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, but there is some other, on the other hand, there is a situation where for some languages, if you write the same thing in Ruby and in Go, you may see that the same code takes a lot of more lines of code, like in Ruby. <clears throat> yeah, and um, one of the other di like, huge differences in Golang is that it has somewhat of a not, not really intuitive project structure. So if you come from a Ruby world and you think that it's enough to just create a folder, put your code in, and try to run it, well, you'll be greatly surprised because in Go, it's somewhat different. So if you go on, yeah, you have to forget about it. 
And you can see the sample project structure here. Uh, it's not really a cool thing of Go. A lot of people are really surprised when they, when they see this. And Hubert states that it's something that has to be paid attention to because you can easily get distracted if you don't know what's happening. So you have to le learn how it's working and read the documentation to understand all the variables you have to set and how the project structure looks like. Um, another talk was by Robert, Roberto Clapis, who is a security engineer at Google. And by the way, this guy is really, really cool guy. And he has a lot of understanding uh, of what's happening behind the scenes in Golang. Um, so one of his examples was uh, the Go routines. So a Go routine, as some of you may know, uh, is something like a, somewhat like a thread, kind of, where you can write concurrent code that is executed in the, at the same time. And uh, it's a sample code here where we have a loop and uh, we spawn a Go routine and we print out the index of the loop. And uh, most of us who see the Go for the first time and start learning it, would expect the result of this code to be something similar to, to what we see in the bottom. So basically a shuffled uh, lines of, of indexes, which are not ordered. So before you go on, uh, how many of you think that it's going to look like this? Like being completely honest. Can you raise your hands? Okay, a little bit, no one? Okay. One person thinks that it's going to be this way, yeah? Two guys. Anyone else? No? Okay. So it's kind of a different thing because at the, at the GoGoCon, when uh, Roberto thought, like he said about it, a lot of people raised their hands because it's something that a lot of novices would, would, would think that is going to be this way. Uh, however, the result of this code is this. And um, this was actually an introduction to what Roberto was talking, uh, and it was the Go scheduler and the way Go handles Go routines. And why the Go routines are really cool and effective. How, how can it be that uh, Go routines can be spawned like in millions of, uh, of, of uh, instances? Um, so just a quick, quick uh, explanation of what's happening here is that uh, the loop goes on and it spawns the Go routines, but none of the Go routines start executing before the loop ends. So this is why you have this result. Um, yeah, we can go on. So uh, there is lots of things that Roberto has brought into his presentation, and uh, it's not really a good idea to compress them here. So if you would like to learn about the tiny things that you can encounter as a novice, uh, go on and uh, check out his link. We'll also give that to the in the in the platform. Um, yeah. So that's com Kubernetes. So maybe I'll hold the microphone to you. Okay. Uh, so obviously, Ashik uh, asked me to talk something about, uh, to tell you something about this presentation because it was not really interesting. So I, now I need to uh, <laughs> um, tell you something uh, about it. But uh, but so yeah. So in general, this guy t uh, told us a lot of like basic stuff about Kubernetes. So how it works in general, like um, yeah, you can. <laughs> Um, that in, in general it exists, exists and it works and he told us something about the basic uh, concepts behind it and there was a demo and of course if there is a demo during this kind of presentation we expect that uh, it, f it will fail but uh, <laughs> that surprising thing was that uh, it was successful so he managed to show us something but like I would say that most people were not really interested in that and simply there is not much to show um, more than in the doc documentation or any other tutorial or whatever so we are not going to talk a lot about it you can simply talk to our CTO and probably you will know much more about it uh, than after this <laughs> after this presentation so yeah let's continue okay so yeah uh, maybe I will like ask Yashik to continue yeah. Sure. Yeah. So um, also there was a talk about everything that went wrong uh, by Satyajit. I hope I pronounced that well. That well. Uh, he's a staff engineer at Solaris Bank. And uh, the talk was uh, mostly of like results of his experience, like what happened uh, and what can go wrong and what can you not expect or expect as a software engineer. Um, yeah, one more. 
Okay, good. Okay. So one of the uh, faults he has uh, is that software programs are like cockroaches and you don't expect them to live that long. It was mostly about the approach that some of us have when um, we, knew, we know that the feature will be refactored later or we think that something will be a temporary fix or a temporary solution to a problem. And the problem is that often those solutions, those temporary solutions, they keep on living for years, months, and they continue to grow uh, in the lines of, co line of code. And uh, this is something that you have to sometimes think through because if you always have that approach, you may end up with a spaghetti code or something that you don't really want to maintain later on. So, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, another thought was you should always keep the code obvious. Uh, it's something that we do in visuality, uh, especially with tests. At least that's the idea where we have all, all, all things written in a kind of like procedural way. Um, and uh, it's also something that is really interesting in Go because in Go, a lot of people suggest that you should read standard library because the idea uh, in writing code in Go is that there should be only a single single way to do things. So you shouldn't really have those, those, those thoughts like, how can I do this? Should I do this uh, in this way or another way? You should rather focus on actually writing the code instead of you know, thinking about if, is, this, is this code going to look better or is it going to be, I don't know, um, funkier, maybe may more, more hyper. Um, so that's really, that's really a nice thought about Golang, uh, is that if you read standard library, you should always knew, know the, the obvious code, if it's obvious or not. Uh, yeah, use them relational databases. So he also said that if you think that you have to go no SQL, uh, you probably don't have to. Uh, it's something that actually is popular on the web right now. So you shouldn't really go for no SQL because you're not that big or don't, you don't really need that. And uh, if you press one more time, you also don't want to, uh, to end up having joins in JavaScript. It's not something you would like to handle later on. So yeah. One more time. OK. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is actually a quote of his. Uh, when we break up big things into small pieces, we invariably push the complexity into their interactions. And uh, it's something that, that I experience as true in, in SecureEdge even, uh, is that when you go for microservices, you have to also keep in mind that you will have to maintain the communications between those microservices. And uh, he gave some examples, but I honestly don't remember what was this about. But um, I think that even in the, in the Golang meetup that Pavel and uh, Prokop attended to lately, there was some talk about microservices being funky at times. So yeah, this is another thing that to consider when you have to uh, or you want to export some code base to another service is that you will also have to maintain additional layer of communication. So yeah. And uh, this is what I said before. So a lot of people suggest that you should read Golang standard library just because it's very well written. And uh, it gives you the idea on how you should write Golang code and that is usually a single way to do things and a very simple one. Yeah, uh, and the last talk and I think the most uh, surprising one that uh, was enjoyable to watch was by uh, Pedro Proenka, who is an uh, engineering manager at OLX Group. And uh, it was about automating the things for uh, his engineering team. So, Basically, what, uh, what he re uh, recognized in his uh, notice, what he noticed in his engineering team is that a lot of uh, issues are brought up and um, his engineering team has the perspective of the time spent where actual work is more around 25% of their time spent working uh, than uh, like it's, it's, a, it's a one fourth of a time they spend in work at work. And the rest of the time is ticket management, incident handling, and deployments, which is obviously not really uh, a great thing for a developer because we should focus on making the software and not on the operations side of it. And um, 
So what he did, uh, he decided that they should focus on uh, creating software that will allow them to automate some of the things and make the time, make their time spent on working bigger than 25%. So the initial step was to create some um, command line uh, tools to manage the tickets, which would obviously make the ticket management part of their time spent smaller. Um, and you can see the, the GIF with uh, some of the actions handled in the terminal. So you can see that he executes some, some script and then the task is moved to another column, another state of, of uh, development process. Um, and uh, also what he did is that he allowed his engineering team to operate on Jira using a Slack bot, which is also a, a really nice thing. Uh, because they didn't have to, you know, manage going to Jira and find the button that they're looking for. Instead, they just made a, a single call to the Slack bot and it's creating a task for them. So that was really cool. And the results of, of this was, uh, well, as you can see, the time, team perception of, of uh, time spent has improved for actual work. So now, instead of 25%, we have 50%, which is 100% increase. Uh, if you consider what was happening there. And um, also, as you can see, the time spent on ticket management and deployments has lowered. And because of that, they have time to do innovations, which uh, resulted actually, since it's 25, 20 percent, uh, it resulted uh, in a situation where one day a week was uh, dedicated to actually either improving their code base or making new tools to make their work more enjoyable and easier or just faster. So it was a really cool thing for them. Um, yeah. Um, I think it's worth to mention that they automated in a way that they moved all the activities that developer needs to uh, handle outside of, of, of uh, writing the code from like Jira and other, any other tools. And they moved everything, everything to Slack, to Slackbot and to command line tools. So in their company, a developer even doesn't need to open Jira to check the task status or, you know, uh, to start working on a, on a task and mark it in Jira as in, as in progress or whatever. Everything can be done by, by, by those commands and they do it normally. They even can create tasks in Jira if they see some uh, issue that needs to be fixed, they can easily create a, a Jira ticket uh, just in the conversation with, uh, with some person in, in, on, on Slack, for example. So, so it is integrated in a really nice way and it, the, their tools, they, they, it contain like many things, so it can really automate it and it really helps them as they say. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think it's also worth to mention that <clears throat> they also integrated uh, OKR, which we have in the company. And also it's done by uh, Slackbot, so we don't have yet uh, week, weekly planning in our week done uh, tool, but they have. And every week Slackbot uh, asks them uh, what is the progress of the uh, objects, the progress of, the, of objects uh, in OKR, and then even they don't have to look at We've done our other similar tool to, to complete the progress or something like that. And so basically, they can easily remember to, you know, to work on Yeah, exactly. Those so I think they have everything automated <laughs> in this company. One other uh, enjoyable thing was that they compiled the Geekbot statuses like we do at, at Visuality. They made it <laughs> so it compiles into a single document and is sent to the client later on. Well, to the upper management, let's say. So that was really cool as well. Oh yeah, that was really inspiring stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, I think uh, for that, yeah, that's it. And uh, that's it for the presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you.